Hogwarts, the school of witchcraft and wizardry. For thousands of years, it had been the epicenter of all things magical, mystical, and mysterious. And ever since you'd left Paris, and helped the Philosopher's Stone to safety, it had become your home, your hospice, your very own magical world. After befriending three students by the names of Ron, Hermione and Harry, they'd helped you accustom to Hogwarts life, and the four of you looked out for each other. However, such is the way in this wizarding world. Your life would soon take a remarkable and momentous turn. So as always, lie back and take a nice deep breath. Welcome to Snooze with Sam, and welcome to this magical Harry Potter series, The Chronicles of Hogwarts. Professor Dumbledore was a wise, all-knowing wizard. Very little got past him, even during his respective youth. A man well ahead of his time, he had spent a lot of his life educating himself on the dark arts and past historical events of the wizarding world. He had known the Philosopher's Stone was in danger the very moment it was created in the hands of Nicholas Flamel. Such a specimen could not possibly exist undiscovered for long before the prying ears of less favourable individuals caught wind of it and made it their object of desire. And so he had sent word to its creator. He warned Flamel of the stones and his likely demise should it remain in his possession. There were people out there who desired to obtain it above all reason. Foul, evil creatures that would stop at nothing and take no mercy in their pursuit of everlasting life. Flamel had been reluctant at first, for it was his very own, his child, his creation, his lifelong dedication. However, he could see the sense in Dumbledore's words, 
and eventually conceded that it must be kept somewhere else. Somewhere safe. He saw that Dumbledore did not want it for his own, and he merely desired that it remain out of the hands of evil itself. Nicholas trusted him. He had no reason not to. And so, in the hands of a young apprentice of Nicholas's own, the stone was transported from his home in Paris in total secret. Not another soul knew aside from this person's assigned counterparts, and no one else should know either. That was until one particular afternoon. There was a rapid wee knock on the door of Dumbledore's classroom, and the door was already opening before he could respond to said request. He was in the middle of scribbling some findings from his prospective third year examination, quill in hand parchment in front of him. He had compiled the most unusual exam any of them had ever taken. A sort of obstacle course outside in the sunshine, where they had to wade across a deep paddling pool containing a grindelo across a series of potholes full of red caps, squish their way across a patch of marsh while ignoring misleading directions from a hindi punk. Then climb into an old trunk and battle with a new boggart. Most of the students had fared through the test, though a few had predictably become lost and temporarily enslaved by the magic of foul creatures. One poor soul was even hospitalised after an unplanned encounter with a werewolf. Though this was the accepted risk of partaking in such a field of study. They would be okay. But sometimes this was the price one paid for a lack of preparation. The door swung open with urgent vigour, and in strode a flustered Professor McGonagall. Her pointed hat swung from side to side in sync with her harsh footsteps upon the stonework. The peace and quiet was immediately shattered causing the beautiful phoenix perched on Dumbledore's desk to fluff its crest in alarm. Streams of sun rays shone down through the dusty air from ornate stained glass windows. On every flat surface Reams of parchment 
and books were scattered and balanced, seemingly in no order. However, one would suppose the great wizard knew where to find everything, should he be asked. Dumbledore stopped writing and lifted his attention from his notes, peering over his spectacles and bottling his quill. He greeted Professor McGonagall with a very warm smile and stood from his enormous antique desk. Oh, good afternoon, Professor. How can I help you? He asked, clearly seeing she was in some form of distress. Well, Professor Dumbledore, I am very sorry to be bothering you on this lovely afternoon, but I was hoping you might be able to shed a little light on something. It seems as though some of the students have spotted a strange figure lurking around the corridors over the last few days. Though seemingly none have been able to identify who it might be. Do you know anything of this, Professor? Professor McGonagall stared at Dumbledore through her own thin-rimmed spectacles with taut suspicion. It wasn't so much of a question, but more of an implied allegation, as if she was expecting to be informed about something that she had not been made aware of. To some degree, she was correct. Dumbledore calmly sat back down in his chair, settling his lavish and colourful robes beneath him. He sighed, and folded his hands on his lap. The clock in the corner of the room ticked softly. She waited for him to speak. Professor, a few months ago, I arranged the retrieval of an object. It was brought to Hogwarts, under guidance from the Ministry of Magic, after the rumoured rising of Grindelwald. It was to be safe here, or as safe as possible in such a world as ours. But word of these suspicious sightings has grown concern within me, I cannot deny. Why on earth did you not tell me that you had brought something so dangerous to our school, Albus? shrieked McGonagall, who was struggling to maintain her composure. The specifics of the item in question were of no concern to anyone who did not need to know of its coming. Please, Minerva, don't take it personally. The task was entrusted to one person, 
and one person only. Three other students were made aware of the situation so as to guide and help protect them once they arrived. I trust they have all been loyal in their secrecy, that's for sure. So who was this person then? Was it a teacher or a muggle? Our most recently acquired student, as a matter of fact. I believe you have taught them yourself a number of times. And what exactly is this thing which threatens to endanger us all, then? Dumbledore paused a moment, choosing his words carefully, though saw no alternative but to be upfront. It is the Philosopher's Stone of Nicholas Flamel, an elixir of life. Professor McGonagall held her hand up to her forehead and then ran it through her hair in disbelief, exhaling a distressed sigh. Albus, that is no joke at all. The whole world would come knocking on the door of Hogwarts if it knew of its whereabouts. So, are you telling me, Professor, that there is someone or something that knows the stone is here? And that it's wandering around the corridors of our school as we speak? Well, it does seem that may be the case. But how this has happened, I do not truly know, though I have my suspicions. McGonagall stared into space, her mind racing, attempting to provide insight and solution. So. What now, Albus? What do we do? The great wizard stood and turned towards the colourful light shining from the window behind his desk. He took a few deep breaths and closed his eyes. He willed for guidance and answers. In time, they came to him. My heart tells me that the stone bearer already knows of this situation. Sometimes, Professor, Things are out of our hands. We will bide our time and choose our moves carefully. For now, we must keep a close eye on them, but trust them all the same.
Harry made for the handle of the cellar door, but before he could lay a hand on it, Hermione uttered a few words of caution. Wait, Harry. Don't you think we should talk to Hagrid before going down there? We've got no idea what lies behind that door. There could be anything, and surely he would know. You nodded in agreement. That certainly was a good idea. Although time was ticking, and as far as you all could know, Quirrell was already on his way to stealing the stone. You could hardly afford endangering yourselves needlessly if you could acquire the upper hand through Hagrid's prior knowledge. So the four of you paused your pursuit and hurried off down the corridor back toward the Herbology Wing. Wait guys, hang on just a second, Ron said, as he scurried back toward the door, withdrawing his crooked wand from his robe. He closed his eyes and scrunched his forehead his lips moving as if in deep thought. Ah, I remember. And with a wee swish and swoop of his wand, he spoke smoothly the word Colaportus. And in an instant, a wee spark flew from the tip into the locking mechanism of the door, sealing it shut tight with a thunk. The three of you looked onwards, contemplating this move. Well... He might be fast, and there's no point in making it any easier for him to escape, is there? Ron shrugged. He had a fair point, though for a wizard of Quirrell's formidable talents, you were sure a spellbound lock wouldn't be much of a challenge for him but it wouldn't do any harm to add another layer of resistance, you supposed. After a few minutes, you'd reached the great door leading from the Herbology Department out onto the grounds south of the Great Hall. It had felt as though You'd been inside all day, and you were glad to finally feel the fresh air of the afternoon in your lungs. There were a few clouds in the sky, but it was a fair day, with pleasing intervals of sunshine. One moment, the sun was obscured, and then it shone in full force and warmed the back of your neck. Four sets of footsteps crunched down the gravel path as you set your sights in the hut a few minutes away. By the edge 
of the Forbidden Forest. No matter how sunny and bright the day, the forest always appeared like a gateway into darkness. It lay somewhere in between sinister and magical, though you knew that within the forest dwelled creatures both great and grim. You had been warned of it. He did never to set foot beyond the tree line. But you couldn't help but be curious. Perhaps one day, when you were alone, and you had a few more spells up your gown sleeve, you would enter to see what lay beyond. Hagrid's pair of octagonal huts drew closer with every step. It was a quaint wee place, with steep slate-tiled roofs and lead spires atop them. The smaller hut was an outbuilding, or his form of a shed, Lent up outside it were an assortment of ricks, trowels, and all sorts of other gardening paraphernalia. The larger of the two buildings housed his living quarters, and it always took you a moment to adjust your expectations to the slightly off-scale nature of it all. At first glance, especially from a distance, these buildings looked very small. Such was their one-room type shape. However, Professor Rubius Hagrid was Half man, half giant. He towered at eleven foot and six inches tall, which meant that his house needed to be larger than your average. The four of you arrived at the various wooden signs, nailed roughly into the ground a few metres from the hut boundary. Keeper of Keys, one sign said. Then another, newer looking sign stated, Hogwarts Groundskeeper. And finally, a third one, hanging at a jaunty angle, and covered in moss, red, carer of magical creatures. It was true that Hagrid had undertaken various official roles since his time working at Hogwarts, though Jack of all trades seemed to fit him best. He was an integral part of Hogwarts, and everyone knew it. He might have stood at twice the height of the majority of you, but he was seen as an equal, and he saw everyone else as the same. 
but most importantly, he was everyone's good and dearest friend. In front of you, the groundkeeper's cottage loomed above, belying its diminutive proportions from afar. Before any of you could climb the large steps up to the front door, you heard a bassy hum from behind the smaller of the two buildings. Hagrid, are you there? Hermione said. What? Who's that? Have I got some visitors? Promptly you trod through the rutted turf around the shed and were met by a very muddy Hagrid who was up to his ankles in soil. Spade in one hand, cluster of dirty carrots in the other. Oh, it's you four. What a pleasant surprise. I was just doing some gardening while I had an hour or so spare. And um, haven't you got any classes to be in? I'm not complaining, just curious as all. Um, oh, have you met my newest addition to the family yet? As he said this, he took a big giant sidestep and revealed to your shock a small greyish black dragon. It was tied up with a rope to a nearby post and had been preoccupied chasing a beetle until it then saw you all and gave out a rather friendly sounding squeak whilst tugging at the rain. This here is Norbert. Don't worry though, he don't bite. Not often anyway. Hagrid keenly pointed out. And before any of you say anything, he is not an illegal dragon, and all those who it concerns know about him. He's a runt, and not a pure breed, and it's expected that he'll not even grow to half the size of a normal adult. The, the bloke I bought him off in the pub said he was half Norwegian Ridgeback, half Welsh Green, which is supposed to make him a docile combination. He found him abandoned, you see. Needed to give him a good hope. And I just couldn't resist, could I? Look at him. Ain't he adorable? Hagrid stooped down to scratch the ear of this wee thing, which only stood at around two foot tall. One of Norbert's eyes was bright green, whilst the other was a deep purple. He purred and whirred similarly to a cat but with a few more squeaks and shrieks. Ron looked on, still a little suspicious. So, he's only gonna grow to half the normal size. Oh, well, that's, that's all right then. That'll only make him a twenty-foot-tall man-eating beast then, won't it? He sneered semi-sarcastically. Say whatever you want, Mr. Weasley. He's found a good home here. 
Now, was there something bringing you all here? Or were you just skiving and wanting a chat? You stepped forwards. Actually, Hagrid, yes, there is something. And it concerns what lies within the cellar. Hagrid's expression changed. It relaxed, but was stern at the same time. Oh, he said flatly. Well, we we better we better go inside and get the kettle on, eh? This calls for for a cup of tea.